All right, we're on the Yellow Brick Road, and we're on the Yellow Brick Road to build a real estate business. This is your playbook. We're on the Yellow Brick Road to build a real estate business that will gross you a million dollars in commissions. The Millionaire Real Estate Agent was written based on the best practices and principles of the top real estate agents in our country that were earning a million dollars a year at the time the book was written, which, by the way, was 2003. Uh, the number of agents that are earning over a million dollars a year is much higher, and the amount of money those agents are earning is much more. Now, I don't share that with you to impress you. I'm sharing that with you to impress upon you that if they can, you can. If I can, you can. Holy cow, if I can, anybody can. <laughs> so, the millionaire real estate agent, I am on the path to building a millionaire real estate business to gross a million, to net a million, to receive a million, and finally to give away a million dollars because I walk like, talk like, look like, and have the checkbook of a millionaire real estate agent. How many of you guys have noticed that we begin every Survive to Thrive call with an affirmation? We end every single Survive to Thrive call with an affirmation. Anybody notice that yet? Yeah. And the reason for that is if you're not saying these things, I'm going to say them for you because my intention is to change the way you think. 90% of success is mindset. The greatest advantage that you will have is how you think. All right, so we're on day six of the Yellow Brick Road. And the Yellow Brick Road is simply a written um, formula for how to read this book. In other words, if I gave you the millionaire real estate agent, Natalie, and I said, read it cover to cover, are you going to get value? Yes, you are. Now, if I give it to you with an outline and tell you, here's how I want you to read the book, you're going to get into production faster. The mission statement of Keller Williams Realty is to build careers worth having. So here's how to read the book in order to build a career worth having. The second part of that mission statement is to build businesses worth owning. Here's how to read this book in order to build a business worth owning. Now, the last part is life worth living, experiences worth giving, and legacies worth leaving. All right, so part six. Maybe it's part seven. I did this on Friday. Here we go again. It is part seven. <laughs> I actually wrote it down so I had to remember this time. We're back in the organizational model. Your homework is to read pages 161 through 171. The organizational model is 158 to 172. Now, here's something I want you to notice. 158 to 172, Gary Keller talks about the organizational model. Now, out of that, an entire 10 pages is on hiring talent, training and consulting talent. Now, if Gary spent 10 pages on hiring talent, training and consulting talent, you think it's important? Type yes in the chat if you do. Boy, I better see a whole bunch of yeses in there. All right, before we go to page 161, I'm going to pick up where I left off on Friday. We're going to go back to the whiteboard. And building an organizational model. If you are brand new to real estate, that's your organizational model. Everybody has an organizational model, even if you are it. That's your organizational model. Now, in the Millionaire Real Estate Agent, Gary Keller says to do all you can do, do all the business you can do until you can't do any more business. And when that happens, hire talent. The first person you're going to hire is not a buyer's agent. It is a lead admin assistant. Now, this person, if you hire the right person, will become your CEO. They're going to be able to run the business for you. Your next hire is not a buyer's agent. It is another admin. 
either a transaction coordinator or a listing manager or someone who actually does the job of both. They're both a transaction coordinator and they're a listing manager. Now, this is if you have a transaction coordinator who is in-house versus one who is out-house. Out-house simply is someone who is a virtual transaction coordinator. They're not a part of your team. You're just paying them per transaction. Now, the going rate in our market anyways is $400 to $450 per closing. And you, you can just do the math and that'll tell you when it would be cost efficient to hire someone who's a part of your team versus paying someone per transaction as a virtual transaction coordinator. Now, the next hire is not a buyer's agent. The next hire is another admin. Now, I've got a listing manager, transaction coordinator, and an administrative assistant. The next question is, when do I hire each of those people? Well, I'm going to give you numbers just based on having a model. When you are closing two to three sales every single month or 24 for the year minimum, start looking for your admin. And we're gonna, when we talk about hiring talent here in just a few moments, you're going to learn it's going to take a long time to find this person. So start looking for them before you need them. If you wait until you need them, you're going to hire out of convenience, and it's going to be a bad hire. And the cost of the bad hire is a lot of money. It's a lot of time, and it's frustration. It's resignation. In other words, I tried that team thing. It doesn't work. I'm going on my own. Now, if I hire the right admin, they should plus 12 my business. So now I'm at 36. Once I get to 36, I'm going to start looking for that next hire. Again, it should plus 12 my business. I'm at 48. And the next hire, again, should plus 12 my business. I'm at 60 closed transactions. Now, by this time, you as the only real estate agent who's a part of this team are closing 60 homes. Are you busy? Yeah, you are. But the only thing you're doing is the 20% that leads to production. Your admin team is doing everything else. However, at this time, you're gonna to wanna to focus more of your time on the listing side of the business, if not all of your time on the listing side of the business. And then as soon as you have this foundation, it start to hire, it's time to start hiring people who are part of your sales team. In other words, I'm going to hire a buyer's agent. I might hire a couple showing assistants. It might take me two to three years to hire these three, put, these three people. And as soon as they're hired, I can hire one buyer agent, two buyer agents, and three buyer agents in the next six months. This takes time. It's going to happen really fast. Now you're building an empire. All right. I went through that fast because I want to get to the book and talk about hiring talent versus not hiring talent. Brian, you got your hand up. Talk to us. Hey, John, thank you. When do we hire the showing assistant in that process? It seems to me, and the reason I'm asking this is uh, I only have three active listings. And basically, they all came up on Friday and Saturday. And every day, I'm receiving a call to go show the property. You could hire a showing assistant right now, uh, just like you could hire a transaction coordinator right now. That's just a matter of personal choice. Now, a showing assistant doesn't have to be on your team in order for you to hire them. In other words, you can advertise for real estate agents who want to earn additional money as a showing assistant to help you, support you, leverage, uh, and you pay them per door. Uh, you could also give them a bonus at closing, uh, but you could hire a showing assistant right away, Brian. What is the normal compensation for that model? Look in your market center and see who has showing assistants. Look in the Fort Lauderdale market center, same thing, and ask around because it changes based on location. I'm going to say somewhere between seven and ten dollars a door or somewhere between 15 and 20 dollars an hour. It, and it varies. 
Thank you so much. So you could pay them per door, meaning if they have five properties to show and they show five properties and it's $7 a door, it's $35. Now it's cost effective, a lot more cost effective. Cost effective is not right the right, right word. It, it, it's more economically fair if it's per door, if they're showing condos and they're all in the same building. However, it may be more fair if it's a dollar per hour fee, if they're driving 10, 15 minutes between every single showing. Does that make sense? So, yeah. And what is the fee at the end, the bonus? Up to you. I'd give them 5% of the gross commission, maybe 10%. Again, it's up to you. Thank you. Gonzalo, talk to us. Hey, can I add something about the please, please do. So, Born and raised in this area, if it's close to the agent's home, it's between $25 and $30. Total per or door. per door? Per door. Wow, I was way off. Now, um, <laughs> they're showing, let's say they're showing five properties in the same community. You can work something that now and say, hey, let's do 20 per door because it's in the same area. Yeah. And, um, and the bonus at the end, that's up to the agent. Yeah, so Gonzalo, what I'm hearing is it, it works out to about 20 to $25 an hour. Yes, now if the agent is in Coral Springs and I need someone to show in West Palm Beach, yeah. we can put it up to 50. Okay, so if there's driving time involved, you can raise that showing fee all the way up to $50. Yes, yes. Yeah. Now, what you're getting back, Brian, is two, three hours of your time you spent $50, let's go with the max, and let's just say it's $50, and let's just say you get back three hours of your time. What would you spend that three hours doing? Lead generation. Um, and if I if I wanted to just do standard 10% at closing, is that too off? Meaning no. you need to get, no. you, you need to give them money, whether the property closes or not. That's why you have the per door fee. They need to get paid whether or not that property goes under contract and closes. That's why you have a per door fee. Now the additional money is just a bonus based on closing. And the right answer to what are you doing with that time that you're getting back, you're buying back is more lead generation. And if you're able to get another listing appointment because you had an additional three hours of listing of, of, of lead generation, and your average commission is $8,000, you spent $50 to make 8,000. Is that a good investment? Yes. yes. Two people said, yes, awesome. <laughs> <laughs> the rest of them are like, hmm? <laughs> kidding. All right, page 161, hire talent. Here's what Gary has to say. The fundamental principle guiding, guiding any hiring decision, thank you, Gonzalo, guiding any hiring decision you ever make is this. Always strive to hire talent. We say someone is talent when he or she is a superb match for the criteria you have established for a particular position. By this, we mean her natural abilities, skills, experience, and aspirations all line up around the job description and give them every reason to succeed at a very high level. This allows you to judge people against clear criteria against judging them as people. A candidate is therefore either a great fit or not a fit for the job rather than being a good or bad person. If you don't have a process for hiring talent, how do you hire people? If you don't have a clear process for identifying talent based on a role, if you don't have a clear process for hiring talent, how do you hire people? The answer is really simple, guys. Emotions, I like you. Chemistry, Chemistry good answer. Instinct, good answer. I know someone who knows someone who knows someone who's looking for a job. Oh, you'll do. Yeah. And 
if you hire the wrong person, not only are they going to not help you make more money, they're going to end up costing you a lot of money. The cost of a bad hire versus the return of a great hire. Now, if I'm at Keller Williams Realty, I am taking career visioning over and over and over and over again. It is a class that is offered through Keller Williams University. You should master that class, just like you should master this book. I've been in masterminds with Gary Keller for 20 years. And for 20 years, I've heard Gary Keller say, take career visioning. Now, it wasn't always called career visioning. It was called something else before CV there. And I heard him say over and over and over again, take it 12 times. It's not a class you take and check off your list. You want to master lead generation. You want to master the conversations of real estate. You want to master your listing presentation. And you want to master the process for hiring talent. It's important. And you're using a KPA. It's free. Why wouldn't you use it? Why? Well, it's free to you. It costs the company money. <laughs> Why wouldn't you use a KPA for every single hire? If you looked at my KPA, I'm a 97% match for the team leader role. In other words, I'm a good fit in the team leader role. I'm a horrible match for every other role in our company. In other words, I suck in every single other position in our company. I would be horrible. Now, I talk well. I didn't say I talk good. I was tempted to. <laughs> I, I talk good. <laughs> I talk well. I can present well. I'm a great salesperson. And if I met with Alan Waxman, the OP of the Coral Springs Market Center, and I applied for the Market Center Administrator job, just based on chemistry, he would hire me. And the company would go out of business in less than six months. <laughs> That's how bad I am. Thank God we have a team leader role in our company. Otherwise, I wouldn't be here because it's the only job I'm qualified for. <laughs> All right, whatever, moving on. All right, Gary goes on to say, when you surround yourself with talent, your life will never be the same. Hmm. Here's how you'll know when you've hired talent. Talent pushes you to get answers. Non-talent will have to be pushed to want answers. Talent shares your goals and fulfill your needs as a natural byproduct of fulfilling their own. Non-talent doesn't fulfill your needs and ends up giving you back pieces of the job. Now, if you've ever been a business owner or you currently own a business and you have employees and you're hearing this, you're probably having ahas. In other words, Oh my gosh, he's talking about Sue. He's talking about Jason. He's talking about whoever. Clarissa, when you were school administrator, yes or yes, all the time. Did people show up as talent? Sometime. Did some people show up as not talent? Yes. 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 What does talent do for your energy? Makes it up. What does non-talent do to your energy? It sucks the life out of you. Read the energy bus. Do you have energy vampires in your life? Hmm. Talent knows what it wants or it is actively searching to know. Non-talent doesn't know what it wants and isn't searching <laughs> They are, they are wandering generality. They are just floating through life. And they're completely okay with that. Talent pushes you constantly. In other words, I want to stop for a moment. If you're a business owner, talent can be a pain. They can be. They can be a pain in your tush because they are pushing you and pushing you and pushing you for a year and a half. Alan Waxman probably, when he saw my name come up on his phone, he's probably thinking, oh my gosh, here we go again. 
but because for a year and a half, almost every single conversation Alan and I had was, Alan, we've got to change the model. Alan, we've got to change the model. Alan, we have to change the model. Was I pushing him? Yes, I was. By the way, thank God, Alan was the OP and not me, because I'm not a good match for that role. I would have thought, you know what? Let's change the model and the next day it would have been changed. And I wouldn't have taken the time to do it the right way and it would have been a disaster. We would have been out of business in six months. Not a good match for the OP. You guys getting this? Yep. All right. Non-talent requires you to push it. Talent is continually raising the bar and wants to be associated with talent. Non-talent may not know where the existing bar is set or even what bar you're talking about. <laughs> what bar? <laughs> All right, go to the next page, 162. Lastly, you can recognize talent by the way they talk. Their language, now remember, we're talking about in the role. We're not talking about judging people. We're talking about judging people in the role. They're not a bad person. They're just not a good fit for that role. So when we say non-talent, we mean non-talent for the role. Remember, I'm non-talent for every role in this company except for one. However, in the team leader role, I show up as talent. I talk differently. You can recognize talent by the way they talk. Their language is the language of challenge and achievement. When you work with them, talent is about as inconspicuous as a mighty redwood in a field of Christmas trees. Talent stands out. All right, I want you to go to page 163 and I want you to look at figure 21 and figure 22, the cost of a bad hire. So remember, if you hire based on chemistry, I like you, you like me, I like football, you like football, let's work together. It'll be fun, right? The cost of a bad hire, three to four months to interview and hire, although you probably won't spend three to four months hiring based on chemistry, you might hire in a day. Three to four months to train and discover, it is not working out. Three to four months to put on probation before terminating the relationship, except if you're not following the model, you're probably not putting them on probation or even thinking about terminating the relationship because you believe you can fix them. And you can't. And you give them Opportunity after opportunity after opportunity after opportunity. And during this time, you're becoming friends. You were friends maybe before you even hired them. Not a good idea. And can you fire them? Hire slow, fire fast. When some, when, when you, when some, <laughs> when someone shows up, as the wrong person for the role, part ways quickly. Take your time and hire slow. I'm gonna close with this. There is a part of the career visioning process that is checking references. This is so important. And this is the part that people skip or they shortcut it. If you're gonna check references correctly, you're gonna call the three or four people they give you to call. But are they gonna give you someone who's gonna tell you something you don't wanna hear? Of course not. They're only gonna give you people who are gonna tell you how amazing they are. When you're talking to the three or four people they give you as a reference, ask them, who, do, who else do you know that I should talk to? And you're gonna get the name and phone number of somebody that wasn't given you as a reference. When you talk to that person, ask, who else do you know that I should talk to? It's called going three deep. And as a matter of fact, in Keller Williams model, 
if you are hiring a team leader or a market center administrator or anyone who is a member of an executive leadership team within Keller Williams, you cannot hire them. They will not be approved by region or Keller Williams Realty International unless you've gone three deep on references. When Alan Waxman started interviewing me for the team leader role, the interview process was eight months. It took eight months for him to interview me. Probably three months of that was checking references. No exaggeration, I think he spoke to around 30 people. Kept calling me, I need another name. I need another, give me the name of somebody who doesn't like you. I'm like, well, that's a long list. <laughs> How many do you want? <laughs> then he had to defend the hire, which means he had, he had to go to the regional director and the regional director had to put play black hat. Black Hat is the person who sees challenges, who sees problems, uh, and focuses on everything that could go wrong. Alan had to defend the hire. He had to go to Mo Anderson eventually and say, okay, here's what I'm hearing. John's a really bad guy, but I still want to hire him. That's not true, by the way. I'm joking. <laughs> and... <laughs> Time out. <laughs> Find someone that is going to tell you why this person is the wrong person. This is why you shouldn't hire him, John. You still want to hire him and you have to defend the hire. It's worth the time to hire talent. All right. Take yourself off mute. Talk to me. What'd you hear? What'd you learn? Other than I'm a bad person. What'd you hear? Oh, well, you got me with the other then I'm a bad person but on top of that I definitely I definitely heard that when you're talking about going three deep on the references mm -hmm. yeah yeah big it is big Robin you're absolutely right about that and tell the person when you're hiring when you're going through that interview process that this is what you do matter of fact as part of the career visioning process there's a form they sign that says they recognize and understand that you are going to speak to people that they didn't give you as a reference. One of my favorite questions when checking references is, would you hire them again? Why? Why not? All right, Clarissa. Um, that's one thing. That's, well, first of all, I agree with career visioning. It was a great class. Um, and that 30, 60, 90 part. Um, but even as hiring, you know, it is really important to understand that if you do want talent, you should probably not hire someone you know mm -hmm. and love. Yeah. I, I mean, it's just going to be, yes, I know. <laughs> yes, I know. Yeah. But also one of the things as an administrator, when I would check for references is that I would ask people, give me strengths, give me weaknesses. Yep. Yep. And if they can't give me a weakness, that's a red flag. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yep. Definitely a red. If you're telling me this person is great, right, <laughs> uh, no, we're not all that great. Yep. But you have to dig deeper because nine times out of 10, there are some shortcomings and we all have them. Yeah, trust me, I know. I got to hear every single one of mine <laughs> in the hiring process. That was fun. Uh, Diane. I want to pick, piggyback on what Clarissa said because I actually worked in a family business and um, I did hiring for quite, quite some time. And whenever a family member would refer somebody because mm -hmm. they're trying to help them, that never works out. I'm sorry to say. Um, especially for something that you have to invest a lot of time in training for. And the other thing I want to add in terms of hiring as well, um, another red flag that I have found is when they tell me when they're not available without me asking the question first. Mm. I can't do this day or that day. Mm. But until I ask the question, tell me what days you are available it's usually a red flag when they tell you they can't do something before you do. I've learned that in many, many years. Very good point. 
Thank you. Maddie. I was actually thinking of another question I used to ask to level the to ask them what they did that may have significantly changed the outcome of a project uh -huh. authors, or what did they do to help instigate something to make it work? And did they ever do any group kind of things? You know, little things like that. It just goes to show their initiative or how they like to lead or help out in whatever areas they can. So that goes to show if there was somebody that had some strengths there as well. Love it. Yeah. yeah. And hey, by the way, uh, when you're taking career visioning, one of the things you'll see in the interview process, Keller Williams has already given you all the questions to ask. Mm -hmm. uh, they, they have simplified this to you don't even have to, well, you have to think, but as you're going through the interview process, the career visioning process tells you exactly what to say even how to transition from one conversation to another. I mean, it is bulletproof. It really is. Yeah. It's like I used to tell teachers, your lesson plans should look like, and this is what career visioning is, the 30, 60, 90. Your lesson plans should outline every detail to the point where you tell a substitute teacher yes. or teacher what to say. Even so that if Daffy Duck came in, Daffy Duck would be able to be up in front of the classroom and just say exactly what you said. And career visioning does that. They give you the script. I like that. I want to be in a class with Daffy Duck. <laughs> <laughs> how many of you how many of you are surprised? Aaron? Aaron, I heard that. I heard that. I did. <laughs> And I was being really nice to you today. I don't know if you recognized, but, you know, forget that. I'm done being nice. All right, time to get into the script and role play practice. Uh, so it's time to get to work. Uh, what is work? Work is 20 conversations, not 19, not 18, not 17 conversations. Or it's 10, not 9, not 8, not 7. Or it's 5, not 4, not 3, not 2. Whatever your number is, it's your number. Or it's 40. Not 39, not 38 or 37. Hit your standard. Because when you have 17 conversations, not 18, because it's close enough, you didn't have the 18th conversation, which could have been a million dollar listing that you didn't get because you didn't have the conversation. And you're never going to know that you missed out on a million dollar opportunity because you didn't have the conversation. Have care call conversations or have care conversations, not sales conversations. Simply lead with gratitude. Thank you for taking my call. Bring value to every conversation. Focus on getting an appointment, getting a referral, adding somebody new to your database and building a relationship. Find somebody today that is thinking of selling their home, whether it's 30 days from now, six months from now, or a year from now, doesn't matter. Because a year from now, you're going to need listings. You're looking for opportunity, period, not opportunity right now. And meet with somebody today and every day that is thinking of selling their home. Therefore, you will have 250 people in your pipeline to follow up with. And you're going to follow up forever because you reject rejection. Because no is not a word that lives in your vocabulary. No simply means not yet. Remember that people will never change their mind but they will make a new decision based on new information. And when you follow up forever, you're creating emotional proximity, which simply means I'm gonna hire the person closest to me when I make a new decision based on new information. Wendy coming to you. And when I do make a new decision based on new information, that new decision is going to be to, Wendy, Wendy, Wendy. Oh, I can't see all the way in the back. No wonder she's not answering. I'm so, I'm so, how do you like me so far? How do you like me so far? Yeah, thank you. Thank you. When I make a new decision, holy cow. When I make a new decision, they Based on new information, that new decision is going to be to hire you. 
Hire me. Oh my gosh. Oh.